Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. As Bill mentioned, uh, I'm Sarah Devereaux. Hello. Uh, I'm coming to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan, former head of executive development programs at Google. Um, I was at Google for about 14 years, led a variety of uh, community initiatives, all kinds of stuff uh, before transitioning over to do my own thing uh, in uh, leadership and executive coaching, uh, as well as uh, working at a startup uh, called Murmur. Uh, and we're developing a SaaS tool uh, to try to help teams work better together and make work less painful. But today I'm here to talk to you about hybrid and remote work and why the norms and practices that may have served us. And I would say that that's a really big may, like did they actually, you know, were they actually helping? Uh, in our previous ways of working, like why, why those norms just aren't fit for purpose in this new environment, this new reality that we find ourselves in, uh, where we're far more virtual, we're far more distributed um, in the way that we're working together. So specifically, we're gonna talk a little bit about why it's so important to have clearly documented norms that everyone agrees to for hybrid and remote teams to actually be successful. Uh, which norms are most critical for hybrid and remote teams to adopt and then how you can go about implementing, experimenting, and iterating on these norms to ensure that they are truly dialed in to the unique needs of your team and of your business. So, there we go. Perfect. So, I don't think that there are a lot of people out there, like, you know, definitely let me know if you're one of them, uh, that, would, that would argue the point that the world of work has changed a lot um, over the past few years. I feel like when I used to do uh, conferences pre-pandemic, we were talking about a lot of these same things, but we were talking about it in future tense, like future of work, this is what's going to happen. And a lot of those things started to take shape during the pandemic. It's always funny to me when I see people, you know, sort of talking about the future of work and the topics are centered around things like remote um, and hybrid and flexibility, because I don't think that's the future. I think that's the present. Now, if we want to talk AI and GPT-4 and all that good stuff, like then I would say that that's more into the future of work. But so much of what we used to talk to, you know, way back in ancient times in 2019, when we referred to future of work, it's here. It's here, it's been here, and now the responsibility is not to look forward, but to look at what we're doing currently and figure out how we make it better. Because for a lot of people, it's not working. The, the rigid restrictions, right, that used to define our work lives have just been bent and stretched further than I think many of us thought possible. Virtually nothing is the same from our core daily patterns to the way that we collaborate with teammates, everything, somehow feels harder. It feels more disconnected and less certain than before. And I would say that that's for very good reason. The world of work has gone through this tectonic shift, yet most teams are still using the same norms, the same rituals that they used to use at the office. And predictably for those teams who have taken that approach of just trying to transfer, hey, here's how we did you know, accountability. Here's how we did location and hours. Let's just pick it up and stick it into a remote environment. For those types of teams, their current reality just is not working for them. This is what I see most often when I'm coaching or I'm advising with leaders that they're struggling with hybrid and, and remote. And I would say more hybrid than remote. And we'll get, in, we'll get into that in a little bit. They never really set up the system for success in the first place. And when those cracks in the system started to widen, the tendency is to blame the hybrid or, or the remote model, right? Like if I can just get back to the office, if we can just bring them all back, this will all go away. It'll all be the same. All that magic is just gonna magically uh, come back to us. And like, like probably not, right? That's probably not what's gonna happen if you pull people out of that reality and you stick them back into their cubicles. Because the cracks are weaknesses in your culture. It's not about the hybrid or remote. They were always there. The hybrid and remote environments didn't create them. They just brought them to the surface. And as these new ways of working continue, the cracks are becoming 
virtually impossible to ignore. So I wanna talk a little bit about some statistics related to hybrid and remote work. But first I want to just pause for a moment and talk about why I care. Why I care about remote and hybrid working. What's so bad, right, about pulling everybody back, you know, to the office or sticking with remote, you know, for companies that have been able to figure that out and abandoning hybrid altogether. So I, I really believe that it's about flexibility, but it's about so much more that flexibility actually provides. So you heard Bill, you know, say that he's uh, located in Vermont. I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And I really believe that hybrid and remote, if we get it right, has the uh, ability to create better opportunities for more people in more diverse places. And when you create better opportunities for more people in more locations, you're able to spread wealth and you're able to create jobs and you're able to lift you know, economies that perhaps have been devastated uh, by their primary industries you know, kind of going the way of the dinosaurs. So I, you know, I live in Ann Arbor, um, but my family tree is just filled with Detroit, 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 Detroit. Um, and so that's very close to my heart, thinking about how do we bring people back to cities like Detroit, to cities like Baltimore, or to cities like Akron, Ohio. Can you imagine if we were able to bring these high paying jobs that allow for remote or that allow for, for hybrid, um, into locations um, that typically um, over the last several decades just haven't had a lot of wealth associated with them. So I care very deeply about making remote and hybrid work um, because I care about lifting people in locations that I think have been um, quite forgotten um, over the last uh, few decades and, and deserve more. So I wanna talk a little bit um, about a few statistics. Um, that uh, that I pulled around hybrid and remote work, just to give us a little bit of a lay of the land around how things are going. So these are all current to 2023. And there are now three times more remote jobs in 2023 than there were in 2020. But hybrid opportunities are actually outpacing remote. So this is, all of these stats are specific to the United States. In 2023, we have 74% of new opportunities are being billed as, uh, as hybrid versus 15% being billed as remote. 69% of remote employees are experiencing burnout uh, with toxic behavior uh, topping the charts um, as the number one cause. And I started talking about burnout in some of my keynotes uh, back in, what was it, January of 2022. So just a little over a year ago, and I pulled that same stat from the same, uh, the same study, uh, the same organization that's, that's been doing these studies, uh, and the stat was 49%, not 69%. And then finally, 80% of people leaders think that hybrid setups are exhausting uh, and emotionally draining. And I find that word emotionally, that phrase, emotionally draining, particularly concerning. It's not like, oh, it's a little inconvenient, you know, or, oh, like it's a little harder than we thought. Emotionally draining is a relatively dramatic term to describe the experience of people leaders. I find some of these stats surprising, like why is everyone flocking to hybrid when the vast majority of managers are finding it emotionally draining? And, and I find all of these statistics disheartening. This literally just cannot be the work utopia that we were promised. There has to be a better way, and there has to be a better way that doesn't involve abandonment. We're better than that, right? Like the future of work is here and we can figure out how to make it work without just running in the other direction. So, so the question for me that's really on the table, particularly for people leaders, is now what? How do we make this better without running away? And I think the answer lies in something called agreements. So agreements are transparent, iterative, and most imp importantly, collaborative write-ups that clarify team norms, processes, policies, all those ways of working, right? But they're not just documents. 
Agreements are the secret sauce that really defines your organizational culture. There are those implicit and, and explicit understandings and expectations that make you you. It makes your team special. You've probably come across dozens of artifacts that are agreement-like. So things like employee handbooks, standard operating procedures, people policies, but the thing that sets agreements apart is the collaborative and inclusive nature by which they're created. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that. So think about it. How have you seen handbooks and, and policies distributed in the past? What are some of the ways that you've watched these things be developed, the ways of working, right? And then sent out uh, and, and socialized, we often call it, um, with, with employees. I've typically seen them created in some sort of HR or, or executive ivory tower, sporadically enforced by leaders uh, and, and seldom written down. That's where that implicit understanding comes from. And this is not exactly the best recipe for sustained alignment. And so teams struggle with missed expectations and broken commitments, often because they just don't understand what they're supposed to be doing in the first place. And everybody somehow assumes that everyone does understand and doesn't get why they're not doing what they're supposed to do because doesn't everybody just know the way that things work around here? And the answer to that is no. It, it makes sense why teams struggle when things aren't clearly written down and communicated. When teams don't feel a sense of shared ownership around how they work together, accountability and commitments get really tricky. When you throw in the fact that the vast majority of agreements with a team or organization are implicit and undocumented, you've got a recipe for misunderstanding that can quickly morph into distrust or honestly, even resentment. So I wanna talk a little bit about a method for achieving shared ownership when it comes to agreement making. Because like I said, it's just not good enough to write it down and send it out. Employees really do need to be a part of the process of creating, deciding on what to do, deciding on what to try when it comes to the way that they work together, and then iterating on those experiments based on how it's been going for them so that they're then able to create something even better based on their lived experience. So virtual and invisible show of hands, um, but who's heard of participatory governance before? So participatory governance, if, you've, if you're familiar with the term, um, you've probably heard it associated with academic institutions um, or governments, right? I think it's the Swedish government that's most famous for running their entire country um, based on, on participatory governance. But its core concepts, inclusion, transparency, and consent are really applicable across all types of collaborative scenarios. And growing numbers of organizations are adopting participatory governance as a decision-making approach. It's all about putting the power to change and improve the system in which we operate into the hands of the people, into the hands of everyone, the employees, right, in our context. Literally everyone has the ability to define and redefine the way that the system works. And that can sound super exciting and super liberating, but I want to acknowledge that it can also sound overwhelming and scary. I've often had clients who have pushed back on including everyone. Well, won't that just get insane? Like, I'm super worried that involving everyone is going to slow things down. It's going to create chaos. We're just going to be governing by consensus, and that's exhausting. When you govern by consensus, decisions take longer, everything's tiring, and you end up with a solution that actually doesn't meet anyone's needs and is super mundane and uninspiring. Maybe you've got consensus down better within your organization, but that's the vast majority of the patterns that kind of I've seen with the groups that I work with. But there are a few core principles that are unique to participatory governance at play that keep that type of a scenario from happening. So the first one is that everything is an experiment, adopting an experimental mindset. So remember that just because you wrote it down, and again, agreements are all about writing things down, making the implicit 
explicit. And then we decide on what to do with them based on participatory governance. But just because you wrote it down doesn't mean that it's set in stone forever. You're not married to the idea. Every agreement is an experiment and can be changed down the road if needed. You want to keep what works and you want to ditch what doesn't and try to make it better. The second principle around participatory governance is consent is not consensus. And it's a really subtle difference, but it's an important one. So in consent-based systems, you're not trying to please everyone like you do with consensus. You're asking, is this safe to try? Not, do you like every word on the page? And do you think that this is 1000% the right approach? That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, can you consent to giving it a shot? with the understanding that we'll change it by ideally a specified time frame if things aren't working out the way we intended. And then the third principle is progress is always better than perfection. So trying to get things right is, is a common obsession in business. And quite frankly, in my uh, you know pretty much status quo, not so humble opinion these days, it's not serving us. Participatory governance helps us focus our intention on what really matters. It helps us gain clarity, not certainty, which is also an important distinction, through questions. It helps us improve the idea, not tear it to shreds and worth, wordsmith the hell out of it, through specific suggestions. And it helps us to try more things out, to experiment, versus obsessing over getting it perfect. And it does that through that consent process. We also call that safe to try. Is it safe to try? to experiment with this idea. Participatory governance provides the opportunity for people to be involved in directing, in steering, in shaping their organizations. And as a result, engagement, innovation, quality, belonging, all these things that we've been chasing as an HR community for how long, all these things tend to be higher in organizations that use this style of leadership and org design. But the benefits don't stop there. For teams who adopt agreement making with participatory governance, there's even more value to be had. Ideas come from everywhere. They come from across the organization, not just at the top of the hierarchy. Accountability and ownership tend to increase because people feel involved. People feel like their voice matters. The biggest problems are the ones that get solved because it's the, it's the masses, right, that are bringing the ideas and bringing the new ways of working to the top of the pile. So if it's something that they're not excited about, it's not going to rise to the top of things that they want to do. And also co-creation becomes the norm across the organization. So you start seeing people collaborating far more frequently than uh, addressing ideas and bringing ideas to the forefront on their own. And those benefits are only amplified for hybrid and remote teams, where the very nature of the way that folks are working can lead to massive misunderstandings. So think about it, right? Like how many of us have gotten irritated with a coworker over Slack or whatever messaging app you may use, only to find out later that you totally misinterpreted what they said? Maybe their emoji use felt a bit off. Or perhaps you read something as sarcastic that was really meant to be sincere. Regardless of the, of the trigger, you read the situation probably in a way that was fueled by more than one assumption and with a whole lot of scenario building, right? We all know this. We're super good at spinning stories in our heads, especially when we're missing information. And the, the stark reality about hybrid and remote and about asynchronous communication is that we are often missing information because we're missing those visual and those tone of voice cue, cues in a lot of instances, right? Like if you're communicating over Slack, you can't hear someone's voice and you can't see their facial expressions and you can't read their body language. All you can do is read their words. So it's very, very easy to misunderstand people and to start spinning negative stories about their intentions. So let's talk about a few specific agreements, just a couple examples that can help hybrid and remote teams specifically clarify their expectations for how they engage with one another. So the first one is accountability. And I would say also that like all of these, all of these agreements are really important regardless of what type of 
situation you find yourself in. So they're important in the office, they're important in remote, they're important in hybrid. And I would say that hybrid is the one where they are most critical because the hybrid work environment is far more complex than the other two. But they're applicable across the board. So first one, accountability, that practice of meeting our commitments to one another and, and the expectations around what happens when we don't. Because again, the stark reality is that we're not gonna all the time. I was supposed to have this presentation uh, to carry by March 10th. I didn't. Um, I had it to her by March 20th. Um, and, and I didn't meet my commitment for getting it to her on time. But how did we handle that after working together for years um, and having an agreement around what we do? Like, how did we handle it together um, in a way that didn't feel like blame and shame, in a way that felt like, hey, you know what? Kind of not cool. Try to do better next time, but I get it. Second agreement, being present. How do we show up with each other when we're interacting in real time? Do we have our cameras off um, when we're on a virtual meeting? Um, is that okay? Do we need to be specific um, and explain why we have our cameras off, but default to having our cameras on. You know, all kinds of different things come into play in all three scenarios, but specifically um, when we are doing, uh, you know, async uh, or virtual communication, the way that we're present with each other uh, becomes much more complex. Third one, async communication. So how do we show up with each other when we're not interacting in real time? So response times, um, and, and how we express gratitude to one another uh, when our primary form of communication is asynchronous, that type of stuff. Super, super critical for building psych safety and team cohesion. Hours and location, this gets really sticky, right? Like when, where, and how often we expect each other to be available for collaboration. Meeting etiquette, how we participate in meetings, and then all the whens, wheres, whos, whys, whats um, that go along uh, with how we approach meetings. And then finally, transparency. So expectations of how information is shared with whom and when. And I find this one can cause the most angst um, in organizations when they're not explicit about when they will be transparent or when they won't. People get very, very anxious about when information is not shared, when they think they had an implicit understanding that turned out to be inaccurate, when they think that information should have been shared. And when you say that everything should be shared and then you don't, that gets even worse. So agreements, consented to via participatory governance, they're important and they hold a lot of power when it comes to team culture and success. But here's the trick. If the agreement like kind of sucks, like if it's not that good, it's not well written, if it's not, it doesn't have, you know, kind of the, the core components that make a great agreement, then agreements actually don't bring nearly as much value to the team or to the organization. So let's talk a little bit about what a great agreement looks like. What are the components? So the first one is to keep it brief. It can be super duper tempting to include as much detail as possible when putting an agreement together. Everyone loves excruciating detail that covers every possible edge case when it comes to written work documentation, right? So, so it turns out not so much. Um, actually, uh, excessive specificity generally results in more confusion than clarity. We think that by giving people more information, we're making things more clear, we can actually make things a lot more muddy. It can cause folks to fixate on the minutia versus focusing on the true substance, on the most critical components. So it's important to keep your agreements as brief as possible, allowing folks to read the agreement and hone in on the most important bits. The goal is to help people understand what you're suggesting and give them just enough information to decide if it's safe enough to try, if it's safe enough to experiment with. Focus on today, keep it focused on the present and what's happening now and what we're gonna do about it. This is a great method if you're trying to look for ways to reduce your agreement down to those most critical components. So when drafting up an agreement, when I'm, when I'm consulting with organizations and they send me their first draft, right? More often than not for folks who are new, the authors will place an elevated level of importance on the past and even the future. And 
you, particularly for topics that people really, really care about deeply, this shows up most often. And you'll end up with these really long introductions or background sections, right? Um, that are actually longer than any other portion of the agreement. And they read like mini histories, like way back in, back in aught six, here's what happened when it came to learning evaluation. And on page four, I get to what's happening today. Two things happen when an agreement is started that way, when it's got too much context attached to it. So one, you tire folks out uh, before they have a chance to even get to the part of the agreement that's, that's the core, that's the substance that you really want them thinking about. And two, you provide a long list of things that people could potentially argue with that's like just literally irrelevant. It happened 10 years ago. It's got nothing to do with what we're really trying to do today, but people will start giving feedback on what happened a decade ago because that's what they think they're supposed to do. And again, we start fixating on that minutia. So I often advise folks to remove the unnecessary context as painful as it is, write it for yourself if you need to, but then get rid of it. All those over-engineered justifications, those complicated plans for how to mitigate unlikely future risks, if we're being real, get, get them out of there and focus on the bulk of your, your argument, right? Focus on the bulk of your agreement on what's happening now and what you want people to really be thinking critically about and agreeing to do in the immediate future to make things better. Okay, number three, build collective wisdom. Agreements should not be just a list of rules that everyone follows. Great agreements should focus on the constraints, those guardrails that give team members the freedom and confidence to make well-reasoned autonomous decisions. They're more guidance than actual rules. I always tell my clients, like, try writing as if your audience is only made up of smart, well-intentioned people who you trust. What's that smallest amount that you could reasonably write down in order for this group to make good decisions on their own? Most folks are shocked by how much they cut out and by how smart and well-intentioned most people turn out to be uh, when given the opportunity. Number four, discover what works. Once you've got an agreement in place, it's important to measure whether or not it's working. And generally speaking, especially when it comes to team norms and agreements around ways of working, you can get a pretty good idea of what's working and what's not just by asking folks. There's always that potential for bias, but if you start with a psychologically safe environment, the validity of that feedback is going to increase dramatically. People are going to be honest um, with what's working for them and what's not because they've got some skin in the game, right? They're involved in making it better. It's not just I give you feedback and then you make it better. I give you feedback and we all make it better together. And then finally, it's hokey, but it's true. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. When it comes to agreements, nothing should be set in stone. When the team gives feedback, you have to take it and you have to do something about it. People become less engaged because they start to lose hope and they start to lose trust in the system that it will actually listen and it will pivot when they say that something isn't working. Feedback's great, but it's only great if you act on it. Okay, now, I don't wanna give the impression that I'm saying that any of this is easy, it's not. Once you dive into the world of agreements and consent, participatory governance, all this stuff, you'll never go back. It is gloriously liberating. But, but I'll admit that taking that first step can be really hard and the learning curve is steeper than a lot of other decision-making models and protocols uh, out there. And there's one thing that stands more firmly in the way than anything else. And that's control. If you've heard me talk before, you know how I feel about control and systems of control. I believe that it's the biggest obstacle standing in the way of most things at work. We believe that monitoring, tracking, checking in, reporting back, uh, keeping things close to the vest, right? Communicating carefully in a packaged way uh, when, when things hit the fan. We think that all of this is for the greater good. We think it keeps things moving and we think it keeps things organized. In reality, it slows stuff down immensely uh, and it compromises trust. It's not that transparency into the work, for instance, is a bad thing. People ask me about this all the time. Well, you're saying not to monitor, not to track, not to you know, do the daily standup. Isn't that just transparency into the work? Aren't you just 
you know, prompting a call for isolationism, uh, you know, within our workplaces. No, I'm not. Like transparency is a really good thing. But but the difference, right? That fine line is when you're spending an inordinate amount of time talking about and reporting on progress instead of getting the work done, then you're probably in a system that relies too heavily on control and not enough on trust. A culture that's centered around asking for permission versus operating with minimal constraints defined by written agreements, brief written agreements, it not only slows things down, it stifles creativity, it zaps energy, and it decreases engagement and ownership. In short, we're basically destroying intrinsic motivation when we rely too heavily on controls as part of our operating norms. And intrinsic motivation is really a non-negotiable when it comes to agreements, and particularly participatory governance actually working. If, if you're going to try to do all of this stuff in a system that's heavily control-based, you're going to fail. People won't feel comfortable or safe to authentically participate. They'll start saying what they think they're supposed to say instead of sharing their actual opinions, and they'll shy away from hot-button issues and avoid drafting agreements that could rock the boat. So you got to re release control and extend trust in order for agreements to truly work their magic. But here's the thing. I promise it's all really worth it. A culture of agreements is literally what we've all been dreaming of in the people world and what we've been talking about and inching towards for decades. You know, we say that we want inclusion. I, I can't think of a better way to include people than to give them the power to truly change the system and to follow through on it. We say we want creativity. What better way to inspire innovation than to adopt a collective experimental mindset that pushes people to be bold? Accountability, honestly, it manages itself when teams ditch the blame and shame game and they start equally sharing in successes and failures. And finally, that ultimate reward, right? Engagement. And I can't think of a better way to engage folks than to actually follow through on commitments and to stay transparent, sharing it all, the good, the bad, the ugly, no matter what. Because at the end of the day, our teams are smart, well-intentioned adults, and they deserve uh, our trust. So thank you all so much. Um, I appreciate your attention. I appreciate uh, your creativity and your courage. Uh, and I'm looking forward to speaking with you all soon. Uh, at the Colleague Cafe. I'll hand it back over to Bill. Sarah, terrific stuff, as always. Um, appreciate the presentation and lots of uh, reactions and comments from folks in the audience during the course of your presentation. Mm -hmm. We just have about two minutes left now, so I'm going to try sure. to get to a question or two if we can, but then we do have a Colleague uh, Cafe coming up with Sarah at 1220, and you folks will have a broader opportunity to spend some time with her. So uh, Carrie in the audience asked a great question, which is we do need to align leadership to support this. What tips do you have on how to do this when leadership is still firmly in kind of a yeah. come back to the office space? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that one of the things that's really powerful is challenging, uh, you know, in a supportive consultative way, uh, but challenging leaders to, to tell you why. And to have the answer not just be because it makes me more comfortable or because I don't trust people to do their work in a remote or a hybrid context. Like try to get them to actually point to real data uh, that shows that there's a productivity concern outside of the office. And I, I would, I'd love to, you can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, my email is sarah at thirdcoastcoaching.com. I would be shocked if they actually come back to you with a study that act, that truly says that in-office work is better um, on any of these things. So inclusion, productivity, belonging, creativity, collaboration, like it's all a myth. We are not more innovative when we're sitting next to each other in cubes and pinging each other because we're not gonna get up and walk across the room or we're on VC meetings, but we're in an office so that means, and, and somebody else is in another building in that same campus, we're not more creative or collaborative when we're VCing and sitting in an office alone versus VCing and sitting in our home offices. So look for the data, 
and see what people come back with when you ask them, hey, show me why you think this works. Sarah, great stuff. Uh, we are out of time for right now. Sarah Devereaux is a business strategy and leadership coach, ex-Googler at Murmur, and a terrific presenter. She'll be back as part of our colleague cafe at 1220 Eastern time, which is about 40 minutes from now after our next Heat Hope presentation. Sarah, again, thank you so much. Thank you, Bill. Great to be with you. Thank you.